Thank you so much uh, for having me, and I'd like to thank you all for being here, and uh, thanks Cy Wagner for inviting me uh, to speak to you. Uh, this is my third term in Congress, and I am a Democrat, and probably half of y'all are wondering, what the hell is he doing in this room? <laughs> Well, when I arrived, I was born and raised in Corpus Christi. Most of our family members and friends uh, worked in the oil and gas industry along the coast. And uh, when I arrived at the United States Congress, I was shocked to find that Democrats didn't have a seat at the table and really weren't part of the conversation when it came to traditional energy in America. Um, and I formed the caucus my first, my first term in Congress before we ever heard the Green New Deal or any of that kind of stuff. Uh, my second term in Congress, I had reporters coming up to me asking me if I regretted having formed the caucus, and my answer is no, and I still don't regret it. And uh, we, we, were, we were 13 members strong. Unfortunately, I lost four of them in the last uh, election. We're the most likely to lose an election, obviously, uh, but, but we stand with our values and what we believe is right for America and what we believe is right um, for jobs and uh, creating a middle class and and I had this speech, I'm gonna throw this speech in the trash as soon as I finish this conversation because I think all of you know the stats, you know the jobs you produce, you know how we, we're doing when we're doing well on, on energy. Um, but I think we, don't, we, we miss the message sometimes. We do so much good for, for our country, but we're really bad at messaging and uh, telling the American people the good things that energy produces. I have one of the poorest school districts uh, in, in, in the state, in one of my areas in my district, yet these kids are going to Ivy League at schools when they graduate from high school because of oil and gas royalties that that school district receives. And those uh, stories are never told. Uh, the University of Texas receives uh, oil and gas royalties. Uh, we talk, and, and I, I'll, I, if I wanna talk about the border, I'll talk about it later, but if we talk about these three countries that we were just mentioning, and um, Guatemala, for example, uh, it receives some of our natural gas from the Eagleford Shell. So it, it, part of the Eagleford Shell is from my, in my district, from northeast of San Antonio down to the border. We pipe natural gas to Monterey, Mexico, where they, they convert it to electricity and send it through the wires, which is a long way, to Guatemala. A friend of mine uh, started this operation, and Guatemala went from under 70% electrified, I think it was like 68 or 69, to almost 100%, lifting people out of poverty, uh, just making tremendous uh, progress within the country, churning factories and agriculture production, and doing a lot of great things for the country, but yet you never hear about those stories. And um, I can't think of anything more shameful. There's a, there's a, there's a huge uh, national security component to energy that we'd also miss the opportunity to tell the American people and I think I can't find anything more shameful than when I see a Russian gas vessel plugged into a terminal in the Boston Harbor. I think that should be front page news across the country. And uh, it's really shameful that they're not at least buying American gas. I, I, it may have been an exchange or something, but, but still those stories aren't told enough. Um, I was in Poland the year before last. Um, they were building their second terminal and they had an American vessel plugged in uh, selling them Texas LNG and getting them off, at least helping them get off the Russian reliance. And uh, these stories are mostly untold. The jobs that are produced, the average oil and gas job pays $130,000 a year, three times the average wage in America. And when we talk about climate change, I know we're just hearing the different stats, and I'm not a scientist or a climate expert, but I can tell you factually we have lowered our carbon emissions by 40% in this country because of natural gas. Stories that are never told. And, and we live in sound bites and we live in one sentence uh, quotations in this country right now and, and, and probably one of the most divisive times in modern history. And I think it's important that we respond in kind and uh, thoughtfully. Um, South Texas, I think, is a little different than most areas because we work, actually, our workers, uh, people in, in my district work on the oil field uh, and, and in, in the gas uh, environment and in that space, and they have a very clear understanding that that's what puts food on the table, and that's what cr gives people uh, upward mobility into the middle class and beyond. And uh, 
my, my message to you is you control the future and you control the message, but I don't think we do enough as an industry to counter um, this, and I don't think we do enough polling, I don't think we do enough focus groups when there's trouble. Um, I uh, was talking to some folks in the Eagle Bird, and they're like, you know, we're having these protests. This is in Carnes County, by the way. Is anyone from Carnes in here by any chance? I'm sure y'all have some, some production there, or, or friends that are working there. And they, they said, we have these protesters showing up and protesting some of our operations, but none of them were from Carnes County. I was like, well, where are they from? And he's, he's at San Antonio, and it's a section in San Antonio. I was like, well, you need to find out who they are, how did they, they're all young people, where did they come up to, where, how did they start believing these ideas, and what motivates them to come this far and, and create these po protests? I don't think we do that. I think for the most part, we just think of it as just this annoying factor in society that everywhere we work and, 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 uh, and push the industry, we're gonna have this. But I think if we allow it to grow and fester, it'll be a much bigger problem, and I think we need to address it, and we need to address it by telling these very real stories. When we talk about migration, I always say, imagine how much more migration we would have if there was no electricity in Guatemala. And by the way, migration comes from many different reasons. I, I, I heard the, 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 uh, the climate change affected farming in Central America, but if you drive around Central America, it looks like a golf course, right? So it, something just doesn't make sense, but we're not countering those stories enough. And um, I, uh, I started the caucus. We're, we're, we're nine members strong now, enough to stop a, boat, a vote on, on the floor and, and enough to stop the nonsense that's, that's going on in the committees today. And um, there's about 10 tax proposals that impact the industry. We're, we're working every single day uh, with members across the aisle. And, and, um, and I want you to know that there are some good Democrats that really do care about the industry. And I used to joke with my Republican friends and I said, we make up for the Florida Republicans who oppose a lot of this stuff. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so a lot of times, I mean, I was helping my Republican friends get something across, across the finish line with our group, our Democratic caucus. And, and, um, and now we're, we're actually blocking and slow, stopping and slowing some of it down so we've been helpful, and one of my oil and gas friends said, hey, why don't you run as a Republican? And I, my answer to him is, I think I'm more helpful to you on this side. Uh, but but uh, certainly, uh, you know, these are polarizing times, and uh, there's a lot of, of misinformation out there, and I think it's our responsibility to get out in front of it and, and counter every single bit of, of this negativity that's coming out, mostly from the East Coast and the West Coast. And... Um, and I don't think we do enough, enough uh, we don't invest enough in studying, polling, uh, focus groups to have the right message to see what motivates these people to think this way and how can we, how can we change their minds. Uh, in South Texas, even though, uh, well, we, we used to be more democratic now than, than we are now, but, but most of it uh, on energy is because that's where we work. That's where our relatives work. And, and, and that's where many of us have invested and, and uh, prospered. Um, a lot of the uh, small businesses in South Texas relate to energy. But um, we, if, if there's one message that I want everybody to go away on is we need to do more to counter this message. And this helps. I had not never seen these gentlemen before or, or heard of this organization, uh, but I think that they're on the right track and we need to get young people involved and young people telling the story and uh, countering um, just plain old lies and, and think about where are we going. We went from, from importers to exporters. Now we're selling our technology around the world. And if we leave this void, it's not like energy is gonna go away and oil and gas, as long as we like having these gadgets and wearing glasses and reading iPads and phones, oil and gas is here to stay. And uh, it's funny because every uh, protester has one of these in their pockets, right? And, and when you start breaking down the conversation to making it personal to some of these folks and make them understand the importance uh, for, for our country, if we stop producing oil and gas or even slow down our production, it's not going to go away. It's going to be other countries taking our place. It'll be Russia. It'll be Saudi Arabia. It'll be many of our, of our adversaries that are dying. Sometimes I wonder if they're the ones spreading misinformation within our country 
to motivate and cause divisiveness uh, on an industry. I, um, I get attacked pretty regularly uh, from both sides of the aisle, oddly enough, and, and even as much as I do for oil and gas, I get no love for it come November. <laughs> but um, we, we uh, need to um, tell our own folks, in, 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 certainly in Texas, regardless of what party you're from, uh, the importance of our, to our economy. If we were going after the automobile industry, you would have every member in the Michigan delegation, Democratic and Republican, up in arms opposing the policy. If we were going after the movie industry, you would have every member of the California delegation, both parties up in arms. If we were going after tourism and cruising, you would have everybody in Florida, including those Republicans who don't vote with us on oil and gas, up in arms uh, protesting the policies. And I think in Texas, we need to do the same thing. Uh, we need to, this should be an issue that we should all agree on. Um, and uh, I had somebody recently say, hey, you know, you vote, uh, you, you vote on all these energy bills, but, but you also voted to legalize marijuana. I'm like, well, I, I never knew that there was a correlation between the two. <laughs> uh, um, so I think we need to start taking this, this, um, this issue of energy uh, more seriously. It needs to be more of a bipartisan issue, and it used to be. Uh, Congressman Gene Green out of Houston used to lead the effort on energy, and, and I learned so much from him on my first term. I was sorry that he retired. But he, he picked me up one day in his old uh, LTD, like a 1985 vehicle, and it had this faded out uh, uh, sticker on the back windshield. And I looked at it really closely, and it said, Oil Patch Democrats. And I was like, wow, Oil Patch Democrats. It was like a 30-year-old sticker. And he's like, yeah, back in the day. You know, nobody, we, we weren't trying to take on the entire industry the way you hear, uh, the way we see today. But um, we definitely have work to do. Uh, we, we need to elect more members from our part, from my party, the Democratic Party, who support the industry. And uh, I think it's important to be bipartisan in this, in this regard. If there's a Democratic region that you know you're going to have a Democratic elected official, engage them and see where they stand on this issue. Because uh, you may not get them to change parties, but you may get them to agree with you on the importance of traditional energy in America. And um, I'll continue, every day that I'm in Washington, I continue to, to try to oppose these uh, narratives. And, and it's hard when you're doing it alone. So I always need your support. I need the support of, of especially the larger energy companies. And um, I think I, we were talking about banking. I compared uh, Dodd-Frank, and if we have any bankers here, y'all know what Dodd-Frank is. It was huge regulation that impacted our smaller banks. It impacted our community banks. And we lost thousands of them after Dodd-Frank because of a regulation that the larger banks could afford, the smaller ones could not. And I feel that th we're starting to see the same thing in energy. And uh, I'll talk to some of the members of, in the American Petroleum uh, Institute that, that say, hey, you know, we can, we can adjust. But small operators cannot. And we need to be thoughtful and careful to assure that we assure everyone's success and that, and that we have diversity within the industry and we allow mom and pop operators to continue to exist. Um, and with that, I, I, uh, I assume y'all are, y want, my, my district is on the border, so I'm gonna talk about the border for just a couple of minutes because I'm sure people wanna, wanna, I mean, it's a concern for everyone. I'm not for open borders. I'm not for what's happening right now. I've been one of the most vocal members of Congress against this administration uh, for what's happening on my border, and it's really funneled into my district, so it impacts me uh, tremendously, uh, politically and otherwise. When you have 1,800 people crossing the border every single day, 1,500, the numbers are down a little bit, but in a small community of 140,000 people, when you release five or six or 7,000 people within a week, it's very impactful. We don't have the resources to deal with it. And in 2019, I had a deal with President Morales of Guatemala, and I'm trying to, I'm trying to revive this deal. And it was to create processing, a, a safe zone, kind of like we did in Iraq and, and uh, we've done in, in Kuwait and different areas, uh, create a safe zone on the border of Guatemala and Mexico on the Guatemalan side, because I think it's easier to deal with politically than in Mexico, and uh, have migrants who want to claim asylum go there. 
and have the same thing that we have in my district. We have tent cities and we have uh, these massive operations where people come and, and get processed and, 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 and really released. And I envision people being able to ask for asylum on, on a, on a uh, iPad or in front of a computer through Zoom. And if you qualify, you can get on an airplane and fly in and take the pressure off the border. We have to t come to terms with the fact that only about 10% of everyone who's coming across our southern border ever qualifies for asylum. We also have to come to terms with the fact that they all get absorbed by our economy because we have a huge labor shortage in this country. And we need to fill that gap one way or another with this uh, plan that I have that I'm fixing to file when we get back into session. It, it creates a safe zone where people get processed. If you are, um, if you qualify for asylum, you can get on a plane and come in. If you don't, we try to get you in on a guest worker program. And if you don't qualify for either, we try to help you in your home country and get you back to where you came from and take the, taking this pressure off our southern border. Um, we, we need to address this labor shortage. And the only way we're going to do that is by having a robust guest worker program. And, um, and that's something that I'm fighting for every single day. So the deal that I had with pr the prior president of Guatemala and Donald Trump at the time, I, I, by the way, I had more meetings with Donald Trump than I've had with Joe Biden since, I got, since this, this election. Um, but he liked it, and, and he, he, he liked it. We started working towards it, and then COVID hit globally. Not, it hadn't hit in the United States, but it hit globally, and he took the opportunity to enforce Title 42, which just kept everybody across the border. But it wasn't a long-term solution. So now we, we have two new administrations in both countries. I just was able to get an agreement with them, an approval that, hey, we're, we're still on board on, on that idea about two weeks ago. So now I'm trying to bring it back to this administration and say, hey, when we, we need to do this. And, we, and not just because of what's happening in Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador, uh, migration into America will probably never end, not in our lifetimes. And right now it's those three countries down the road. It may be, uh, uh, you know, Peru or uh, Paraguay or uh, Colombia and Venezuela. We're already getting some Venezuelans on, on my border. Uh, so we need to have permanent assets further away from the border. It's like football, right? You, you don't want to stop them on the 99-yard line. You want to stop them further down. And I think we need to have a, uh, a plan um, and uh, do things thoughtfully and orderly. And I think it's something that everybody should agree on. I don't understand why uh, we don't have, uh, and, and now we have a Supreme Court ruling, so the, the administration has all the cover in the world to keep folks on the other side of the border. It's been a huge burden for my district. And uh, everybody blames me. It's like I invited everybody in. I, I actually have done everything. <laughs> I've done the exact opposite. And, I, and I've tried to be, be as loud as possible and try to have solutions because it's very easy to protest the idea. But we need to have a real solution and a real plan. And I think in, until we make those uh, investments and in assets that will actually slow the migration of human beings coming, coming north, we will continue dealing with this for generations to come. And I'm, I'm hopeful that this administration uh, acts and uh, does what's right and, and has common sense ideas. Um, and, and talking about common sense, th th there is still some common sense in Washington. I'm part of a, of, a, of a caucus, besides my oil and gas caucus, which there's only nine of us now, but like, as I said, enough to stop any nonsense on the floor. We're also, uh, there's also a caucus called uh, the Problem Solvers Caucus, and, and we're 58 members strong, 29 Democrats and 29 Republicans. Uh, we get together every week and talk about uh, common sense ideas that make sense for our country. Uh, we're not the guys that get the television time and the, and the microphones in our face, so you don't hear about it. We're, it's, it's not polarizing and dividing uh, the way you see on a few of the channels on TV, whether it's extreme right or extreme left. Uh, I, I feel that our government has been hijacked by the extremes, and, and it's a minority, but it's, it's, um, it's been really damaging to our democracy, and I certainly hope that we can, we can get past this. Uh, th there was just a poll that I read this week. It said 93% of Americans believe our country is divided. And I was like, wow, you know, so it's not just me that thinks that. 93% of Americans, almost 100% of us, believe that the country is divided, and we are. And, and we need to come back together. We need to continue working. And we need to lead the world uh, as we always have, not only militarily, but economically, and through this, certainly through the industry of oil and gas. So... Um, 
Thank you for inviting me. Um, I appreciate being here. I hope that I can continue to engage you. Feel free to drop by if you're in Washington to engage our office. And if there's anything that I could ever be helpful to, uh, please, please let me know. I'm, I'm, there's two members of Congress uh, that are last name Gonzalez from the state of Texas. The other one is my Republican cousin, Tony Gonzalez. Um, so I'm the Democrat trying to help you guys. Thank you so much. God bless you. have the congressman for a few more minutes for some Q&A. So, uh, Jim Wilkes. That's right. Well, um, I say when we get to 218, we are going to be the party of America because we're in the men, where the center, for the first time in a long time, the center has a voice. Uh, if your member of Congress is not part of this caucus, I would encourage them to be. And, um, and it's not easy because some of them are just, just are locked into the right or the left and, and are not encouraged to come to the middle and try to work together. Uh, but we, we, we should encourage people to do so. We need to give members this, the support uh, locally at the, at, the, at the congressional district level whether it's a Democratic district or a Republican district, and encourage them to work together. Uh, we shouldn't be each other's adversary. We have plenty of adversaries around the world, and we should be focused on them. But um, you do have to bring in, so that's a lot of people don't know that. In order to become a member, you have to, you have to find a, a partner on the other side to join so we can keep it balanced. Um, it's only, we're, we're, um, we're on our fifth year in existence. And, and we've done tremendous things within this caucus. Um, just three weeks ago, we were able to force uh, our, our leadership to put the bipartisan infrastructure bill on the, on the floor by September 27th, which we're still struggling to assure that it's done. And uh, so it's a great caucus. I think regardless what side is in control, I think it's a good uh, middle of the road, thoughtful, a bipartisan group that wants to get things done for America and is not just there for photo ops. I took the very first and I think the only bipartisan uh, group of members of Congress to, to the southern border to not for photo ops or political points, but to actually see what was happening and try to encourage them uh, to come up with solutions, which I'm hoping this plan that I'm telling you about is at least the beginning of a solution and that we, have, we can have a, a long-term plan to assure that what's happening on our southern border never happens again. And it's happened on administrations on both sides of the aisle. It, it, it doesn't, it, you can't blame it on a party. It's just something that we're the wealthiest country in the world and we have poverty south of us. And until you uplift the, some of those countries to where they're producing, and, and I always say they need more trade, not more aid. Mexican nationals are going home at a higher rate than they're coming into the United States. So we have a negative net migration with Mexico with the same violence and danger that Central America has, but their economy is functional. They can put food on the table, a roof over their heads, send their kids to school. If you give people the basic necessities in those countries, they will not come. And I think we need to uh, invest in, in places through business, through agriculture, through tourist projects uh, to create conditions for people to want to stay in their native country and and uh, so that's something that I think we need to continue to work for. Yes sir. Will that research that they report uh, that gives the nation actually have an effect throughout It should. So I'm a little upset because I think it should have already had more of a dramatic effect. Numbers have dropped. Um, so I, I believe that in the middle of a pandemic, I don't care if, if who's in office, you have all the cover, political cover in the world to stop the migration anywhere at the border or on the northern border or on our coast and not let people in uh, because we're still in the middle of this, of this pandemic. And, and my district, uh, I lost over 3,000 people, 12 personal friends of mine to COVID. So it's very real. And, and this, the last uh, uh, group that were coming in had a 15% positivity rate. So that's quite high and, and concerning. And, um, impacting our local medical clinics, resources, and uh, ambulances. We didn't have ambulances. So if you had a heart attack and you were calling an ambulance, it was taking 30 minutes to get an ambulance to your, to your door. Uh, so we definitely have work to do. Any other questions, sir? Right. 
we're doing it. We, we've we've uh, we've found about ten or twelve different uh, policy proposals that impacted this this um, industry that we're pushing back on. Some of them are complete have been completely taken off in committee. Uh, we're also in touch with uh, Senator Manchin and uh, Senator Cinema to hold the line on the other on on the other side uh, uh, of the Capitol and. Um, I can promise you it's not going to be as bad as you think because it's uh, we don't have an overwhelming majority. If we did, we would be in trouble. And, um, you know, I have enough people in my caucus to stop any, any bill on the floor right now. So at least we have a seat at the table. We're negotiating. We're talking to, we're talking to folks, and we're getting them to, to, um, to get them off some of these ideas. So we'll continue to do that. Thank you. Thank you, thank you.